Tad. Therefore. Idam. This manifestation. Bhagavan. The personality of Godhead. Rajan. O King. Ekaha. One without a second. Atma. The super soul. Atmanam. By his energies. Swadruk. Qualitatively like him. Antaraha. Without. Anantaraha. Within and by himself. Bhati. So manifests. Pasha. Look. Tam. Unto him only. Mayaya. By manifestations of different energies. Urudha. Appears to be many. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace. A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada. Translation. Therefore, O King, you should look to the Supreme Lord only, who is one without a second, and who manifests Himself by different energies, and is both within and without. The Supreme Lord Personality of Godhead is one without a second, but He manifests Himself by different energies, because He is by nature blissful. The living beings are also manifestations of His marginal energy, qualitatively one with the Lord. And there are innumerable living beings, both within and without the external internal energies of the Lord. Since the spiritual world is a manifestation of the Lord's internal energy, the living beings within that internal potency are qualitatively one with the Lord, without contamination from the external potency. Although qualitatively one with the Lord, the living being, due to contamination of the material world, is pervertedly manifest. And therefore, he experiences so-called happiness and distress in the material world. Such experiences are all ephemeral and do not affect the spirit soul. The perception of such ephemeral happiness and distress is due only to the forgetfulness of his qualities, which are equal to the Lord's. There is, however, a regular current from the Lord himself, from within and without, by which to rectify the fallen condition of the living being. From within, he corrects the desiring living beings as localized Paramatma. And from without, he corrects by his manifestations, the spiritual master and the revealed scriptures. One should look unto the Lord. One should not be disturbed by the so-called manifestations of happiness and distress. But he should try to cooperate with the Lord in his outward activities for correcting the fallen souls. By his order only, one should become a spiritual master and cooperate with the Lord. One should not become a spiritual master for one's personal benefit, for some material gain, or as an avenue of business or occupation for earning livelihood. Bonafide spiritual masters who look upon the Supreme Lord to cooperate with Him are actually qualitatively one with the Lord, and the forgetful ones are perverted reflections only. Yudhishthir Maharaj is advised by Narada, therefore not to be disturbed by the affairs of so-called happiness and distress, but to look only unto the Lord to execute the mission for which the Lord has descended. That was his prime duty. Om Jnanati Mirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Shreemate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha Kalpataru Vyascha Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadhara, Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.
Hare Krishna. Hare. I'm grateful to be here with all of you today. And today I'll discuss on the topic of does love mean protecting our loved ones from the consequences of their actions? So I'll first explain how this topic is related with the theme under discussion and the purport and then I'll get into the discussion. Right now, what is going on is in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, the backstory of the two main characters is being told. How Parikshit Maharaj came to the position where he would renounce the world. Hmm? That is being described. And for that, how renunciation was a tradition in his family. So Pandavas will renounce voluntarily, whereas by their own decision, whereas Dhritarashtra will renounce by the forceful instruction of Vidura. So later on, this relationship with Matirna Krishna Parataha Swatova. That for some people, neither by their own inspiration nor by anyone else's instruction, they will never turn toward transcendence. But Parishit Maharaj's family was one who had turned toward transcendence. So the back, his backstory is told to illustrate what a glorious person he was. Now specifically here, Dhritarashtra has renounced the world. And after that, Yudhishthira Maharaj, as is regularly his custom, comes to offer his respects to Dhritarashtra and he sees missing. What happened? Where did he go? And he is dismayed. At that time to pacify him, Narad Muni appears. Yudhishthira Maharaj is probably among the most fascinating characters in the Mahabharata. Mm -hmm. Every character is fascinating in his own way. But Yudhishthira Maharaj is fascinating in the sense that his, his actions so often are different from what would be a typical human being's reaction to a particular situation. Dhritarashtra was the person who had unfairly partitioned the kingdom, giving the Pandavas the Khandava, wilderness. Dhritarashtra was a person who had insisted through Vidura that Yudhishthira come for the gambling match. Dhritarashtra was the person who, when, Raj, when Yudhishthira was being coronated as the Raj, for the Raj Yagya, Dhritarashtra could not even be bothered to come there. Dhritarashtra was the person who was eagerly asking during the gambling match, has Panchali been won? Has Panchali been won? Dhritarashtra was the person who, after the whole Kurukshetra war ended and the Pandavas came to meet, he leave alone apologizing to the Pandavas for all the atrocities they had done. He didn't even speak one strong word to his wife Gandhari when Gandhari tried to burn Bhima alive. Dhritarashtra was the person who actually tried to crush Bhima. So after all that he had done, Yudhishthir had every reason to be angry at Dhritarashtra. And yet, Yudhishthir was not the least angry. Yudhishthir told his staff, royal staff, that you should treat Dhritarashtra with full respect, as if he were my own father. And now there are some people who it seems as if they have something essential missing within them. And that is a sense of conscience, a sense of right or wrong. Like somebody does something terrible. And then we are struggling with it and we somehow say that, you know, okay, I will, they hurt us, they insult us, they betray us. And then after that, when finally after a great struggle, you know, we somehow decide, okay, I'll let this go. And he say, I'll forgive you. I say, uh, okay, what did I even deserve to do? What did I do to deserve your forgiveness? Not that, oh, I'm undeserving of your forgiveness. I never did anything wrong. Why do you think I need your forgiveness at all? So, there are some people from whom, you know, we cannot even expect an acknowledgement of their wrongs. Leave alone an apology for their wrongs. 
So in such situations, the, if we want to continue the relationship, the only way is to utterly lower our expectations. So this is what Yudhishthir was able to do. But there was one person who was not able to do that. Who was that? Bhima. I thought Bhima was incensed. that this person who did all those things, you know, he is living in royal pomp right now. And we are serving him. So he lived like that for many years. Now, Yudhishthir saw it as his duty. See, Yudhishthir is driven by a certain sense of duty, which is that I need to do my duty irrespective of how the other person acts. This is the right thing for me to do and this is what I am going to do. Hmm? Now, there is a whole question in the Mahabharata. In fact, the whole Mahabharata is an exploration of what is dharma. And so is dharma conditional or non-conditional? Is dharma, is the duty that we are meant to do, is it dependent on situation? Is it dependent on context or is it not dependent on context? Bhishma took a vow to protect whoever was ruling the Kuru dynasty. So this was a vow. Did that vow depend on whether the ruler was virtuous or vicious? Bhishma considered no. Yudhishthir also, to some extent, considered that his duty was unconditional. That I have to obey my elders. In fact, Yudhishthir started gambling not because he, at least when he came for the gambling match, it was not because he was a gambling addict. It was not that he wanted to make a quick buck. He was already the emperor of the world. But he came because he thought, I should obey my elders. So here, so that was, he was driven by that conception of duty. Of course, after the Kurukshetra war, sorry, after the 12 plus 1 year exile, when Yudhishthir uh, asked, basically sent a messenger through Drupada's priest, saying that now exile is completed, please give us our half of the kingdom back. At that time, Dhritarashtra tried to cunningly tell him that, oh, Yudhishthir, he sent Sanjay as a messenger. And he said, oh, Yudhishthir, no, the world is temporary. All positions are temporary. Attachment to the temporary is the cause of distress. Now, everybody who is a grahastha is eventually to renounce the world and take vanaprastha. You are so fortunate, you are already vanaprastha. Why do you want to get entangled in the world now? And not only do you want to get entangled, in order to get entangled, why do you want to fight a war? And that too with your relatives. Now stay peacefully where you are. <laughs> so, this was, this was Dhritarashtra. And of course, at that time, there was a certain amount of uh, pragmatism, a hard-eyed realism came in Yudhishthir also. And initially, he was just unconditionally obey one's elders. But over a period of time, he had to say that. You know, he saw what his obedience to his elders had done to his family. You know, what it had done to Draupadi, what it had done to Bhima. So, so it's sometimes a person is torn between different duties. And by this time, Yudhishthira realized that simply listening to Dhritarashtra would mean much, much more pain on his family and on the Kuru dynasty also. He refuted it. He said, Oh Sanjaya, when did I ever give the impression that I want war? He said, I simply want to do my duty. As a Kshatriya, we are still young. We have our duty to our ancestors. We need to beget children. We need to carry on the dynasty. We need to serve our citizens. And for that, we need our kingdom. So, it is not our request for the kingdom that is going to cause the war. It is the Kauravas' refusal of our reasonable request that will cause the war. So, he was respectful, but he took a strong stand at that time. But eventually, so although there was this realist or pragmatist, as Yudhishthira evolved to be, but after Dhritarashtra's sons were killed, Yudhishthira says that Dhritarashtra is no threat to us. So, he decided again to do his duty and take care of Dhritarashtra. And now, Dhritarashtra has left. Now, again, Yudhishthira took care of Dhritarashtra for so many years, for decades. But, it is, Dhritarashtra leaves without only thank you for your service, I'm going, not even informing. You know, so, 
Now, Yudhishthir has such a sense of responsibility that he's feeling distressed. <clears throat> he feels that maybe there was something deficient in my care. I didn't serve him properly and that is why Dhritarashtra left. And he says, did I fail him? Did I fail in my duty? And he was worried, what will happen to Dhritarashtra? How will he leave? He is old. Now, Gandhari is also old. So at that time, Narad Muni comes over here. And Narad Muni is giving him what seems to be not such directly relevant philosophical instruction. He's just speaking philosophy, and he's saying, the previous verse is ahastan is ahastanam, that one animal, one animal is the prey for another animal. And this verse is saying that the Supreme Lord is the only shelter, everything is his energy. So what has all this got to do with the context over here? So there are two things. One is that the world is a tough place. And second is that Krishna is the ultimate well-wisher of everyone. So when, with this, with this background, let's now come back to the topic which I plan to discuss that does love mean saving our loved ones from the consequences of their actions? So I'll use, speak this based on a Chanakya Shloka that talks more about parenting, but the principle applies to all relationships. So Chanakya Pandit talks about how that Pancha Varshani Lalayet, Dasha Varshani Tadayet, Prapte to Shodashe Varshe, Putram Mitravad Acharet. So he says, pamper a child when they're before, when they're before five, and then discipline the child after five. Then from five to, and Prapte to Shodashe Varshe. And eventually, as the child becomes a teen, then mitra badachari, treat the child like a friend, like an equal, like a being. So now, of course, it is not that on the fifth birthday, suddenly, the parents have to change their demeanor. The broad idea is there is an evolution. The key principle is that the, the way of expressing parental love will vary according to time, place, circumstance. Primarily here, vary according to the age of the child. And that applies in all relationships. So I will use an acronym, PEER. P-E-E-R, to describe this evolution. So first, P is protection. Yes, love does mean protecting our loved ones. Now, and not just from the dangers of the world, it also means from the dangers that may come by their own actions. So, for example, if, if there is a child, a newborn baby is there, the mother is caring for the baby, mother is feeding the baby, and the baby may bite the mother, the baby may kick the mother, the baby may slap the mother. Now, does the mother get angry? You know, you did this, I'll give you the consequence of your action. You kicked me, I'll kick you. No. Now, at that time, whatever your actions are, they are you protect them from the consequence. Even if the baby uh, maybe uh, starts playing with something dangerous, he touches a knife or something and wounds it. So it's not that you did this, now you, you, you suffer for it. No, love means we protect our loved ones from the consequences of their actions. In the initial stages, that is how love is expressed. And that is required. At that time, the baby doesn't understand the principle. Okay, just the baby is just exploring the world. The baby doesn't understand anything. It doesn't even understand that my actions have consequences. Now, a, ba a small baby may even put their hand in the fire and the hand may get burnt. But, but sometimes, of course, we don't keep fire accessible to small babies. Right? If, if parents do that, then the parents are babies who need caring. <laughs> who need caring for. But the idea is, there are small babies, one of my friends is a child psychologist, told me that there are small babies who, they may put their hand in fire and they may get burnt. But they will not make the correlation that putting my hand in the fire caught the burning. Oh, I'm just feeling terrible. Why did this happen? So, so it requires a certain level of intelligence, a development of intelligence, to even understand the principle of causality. That, that actions lead to consequences, and this action led to that consequence. So initially, protection is required. But that is not all that is to be done. So, eventually there is, next stage is education. Education means, that, you know, if you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. 
Mm. And a large part of education is actually educating others about the consequences of their actions. Mm. And without that, the children will not grow up. Grow up means biologically they will grow up, but psychologically they will not grow up. They will not mature. So, if that education is not provided, then what happens is they, they stay infants even if they physically grow up. And such infantilizing kind of relationship actually is harmful for both, for the parent and for the child, for the person who is loving and for the person who is, the, who is loved. Say, education means what over here? That actually, if a child is rude, a child is disagreeable, a child is, is noisy, and then we go to some relative's house, friend's house, and the child is misbehaved. Being, you know, that is embarrassing. But it's not just embarrassing for us. It is not just annoying, upsetting for our guests. Actually, if a child is not trained properly, then other children will not play with that child. And then the child will be lonely. And that child will be unhappy. So actually, in many ways, while parenting, no is one of the most important words a child needs to learn. Not the child says no to parents, but the parents say no to the child. No, you should not do this. Because who will love a child more than the parents? But if the child is doing some actions which the parents are displeased by, then it's highly likely that other children, other children, potential friends of the child will also be displeased by those actions. If the, if the child behaves in a way that is displeasing to the parents, then how can the child ever make friends? Because the child will not be able to moderate the behavior. So how is all this related? See, in today's world, here what has happened is, in one sense, Dhritarashtra, I'll come to today's world, going back to the Mahabharata, Dhritarashtra, in one sense, protected Duryodhan from the consequences of his actions. He used his royal prowess to never give him any consequences. In fact, whatever Duryodhana did, Dhritarashtra either turned a blind eye and mutely consented, or sometimes even openly supported. And you now actions do have consequences. Sometimes, based on past karma, there is a there is a buffer, there's a time lag between action and consequence. But every action has consequence. We can compare this to, say, if somebody jumps, somebody jumps down from a one-story building. You know, maybe they have a sense of adventure, but if they fall wrong, they'll have a fracture. So if they jump down from a 10-story building, well, that kind of consequence is much more disastrous. Now, if somebody jumps down from a helicopter, now what may happen is that as long as they don't look down, they may feel thrilled. Hey, I'm feeling the wind whistling to my ears. I'm having a sight. I'm having the ride of my life. But how long? Eventually, they're going to crash. So basically, by our past karma, we may rise higher and higher and higher. And to the extent we have risen by our past karma, to that extent, the consequences of our present karma may be delayed. That means, say, if somebody is very wealthy, and they do something wrong, say, they drive drunk and they hit someone, and what happens is they use some money, they pay the police, they bribe, they pay off the victims, and the person just just gets a rap on the rap on the shoulder or uh, rap on the hand, and they get away. Okay, once you can do that, twice you can do that, maybe five times you can do that, but eventually, what is going to happen is once good karma is going to good is going to run out. So there can be a buffer which may be created by one's power, by one's wealth, by one's cleverness, even by what we call as one's luck. That once a person was speeding, going away about the speed limit, and then the cop pulled him over, and he says, didn't you see the speed limit? He said, I saw the speed limit, I just didn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is, people think doing wrong, something wrong is not the problem, Getting caught while doing something wrong is the problem. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the problem is that if you keep speeding, then that urge to speed is going to come and eventually it's going to be trouble. 
So the point is that some people get the actions of their, get the consequences of their actions quickly. Some people may not get that quickly. And one, one way that actions, one way the consequences of one's actions may be delayed is by positive past karma. And one way one's positive past karma may come is by having protective loved ones, protecting loved ones. So it may be one's parents, it may be one's siblings, it may be one's uh, spouse, one's friends. Suppose somebody's an alcoholic and they keep making a mess. They have episode after episode, but they keep making a mess. And then they have maybe their spouse or maybe their sibling or whoever that, that cleans up the mess every time. Now they may have that support system, but is that support system helping them overcome the alcoholism? Or is that support system actually enabling their alcoholism? So Duryodhan had some good karma by which he was born in a powerful family. He, but what happened was his father enabled him again and again and again. Till what he did became unconscionable, became unbearable. And eventually the consequences did come upon him. Now what happened was... Dhritarashtra did that to Duryodhana, but here now the question is that is Yudhishthir doing the same to Dhritarashtra? Is Yudhishthir protecting Dhritarashtra from the consequences of his actions? Dhritarashtra, as I mentioned, was never made to pay for his actions. And Yudhishthir didn't even expect that. But time takes its toll. Eventually, even if one is powerful right now, we are not going to be powerful forever. You know, time is going to take it. So Dhritarashtra is becoming old. And at this point, what happens is that Narad Mun Vidura comes and shocks him out of his complacency. And Dhritarashtra realizes what Vidura is saying is true and he renounces the world. And when here Yudhishthira is feeling guilty, so Yudhishthira is being told, this world is a harsh place. So I talk about education means that we have to educate our loved ones about the consequences of their actions. And we may say we may protect them from the consequences of our actions, but we are not going to be there all the time. So even we will not be there, it's not always possible for us to protect others. That's why eventually they have to take, take responsibility. And that brings, I was talking about the acronym PEER. So E for second E is education. So, Protection is the first part of Chanakya's verse, that la uh, layet, just, just, just care, take care for it. The second part is tadet. So disciplining involves education and then evaluation. Education means, okay, this is the action and this is the consequence of this action. You learn properly about this. And then evaluation means, is this person learning the lesson properly or not? If that person is not learning the lesson, then we have to evaluate, okay? Sometimes what happens is, see, the consequences of the actions can come in various ways. If, say, the parents don't give the consequences of their actions to the child, then maybe the neighbors or other people, if the child offends them, the, the child may get beaten in school. Eventually, the child commits a crime, the child may be in jail, and the law may give the consequences of the action. So evaluation means, at that point, one has to actually evaluate. Is this person... If some, somebody has got into trouble, then is it just because they faced a problem way beyond their, their capacity, that's how they got into trouble? Or is it because they, they messed up? That they didn't, they acted rashly, they acted irresponsibly, and that's how they, <clears throat> they ended up in this situation. So the, if that evaluation is not there, the help that is offered can end up causing harm. Hmm. You know, Srila Prabhupada was the embodiment of compassion. And at the same time, Prabhupada was, was also a hard-eyed realist. And sometimes it may come off that Prabhupada was against humanitarian work. He said that, you know, that actually, you know, we should just focus on sharing Krishna consciousness. No, it is not exactly like that. Prabhupada himself wanted that food, free food be distributed all around the temple. That's how we have the Food for Life program. But Prabhupada recognized that we have to evaluate whether our help, 
the help we are offering is actually helping the person. So there's the leftist ideology that when people do bad things, it is not because they chose to do bad things, they chose to do bad things, it is because society in the past has done bad things to them. That social situations, social exploitation, social discrimination, social unfairness makes people bad. This is the idea. And that's why if somebody has done something bad, the responsibility is not on individual reform, but on social reform. Mm -hmm. Now, California is among the most leftist states in America. So California passed a policy, especially during the pandemic and thereafter, that the law actually, that if anybody goes into a shop and they shoplift, they rob from a shop, but if they're robbing below $600, they will have no consequences for their actions. <laughs> the idea is, their idea is, people are poor, they're starving, that's why they're going and robbing. And now, this is their idea of compassion. But eventually, some survey was done, what are people robbing? People are not robbing bread and food. People are robbing you know, excess, expensive colognes and Louis Vuitton kind of uh, purses and things, but all just below the $600 margin. You know, $555. They'll rob that and then sell it on eBay and other places and make money out of it. So, you know, forgiveness is very good as an individual choice or individual practice. Forgiveness cannot be the default state policy. The state says, if you rob, we will forgive you. No. Then society, there will be chaos in society. So evaluation is required. So sometimes we think of, you know, there is justice and there is mercy. And we think it is, it is actually justice is not compassion, only mercy is compassion. Or justice is not kindness, it's mercy is kindness. No, sometimes justice is kindness. So mercy means what? We could say in this context, mercy means a person is saved from the consequences of their actions. And justice means the person is given the consequences of their actions. Sometimes it is justice that is kindness. Because only then will the person learn that I cannot act like this. If I do like this, there will be trouble for me. There will be consequences for my actions. So, both justice and mercy are actually manifestations of kindness. And here, there is this so the first part, the previous verse, Dr. Ahastani Sahastana, or describes that one animal is the prey for another animal. So the point is that this is the theme that is being talked about underlying. Yudhishthira Maharaj is being told by Narad Muni that this world is a harsh place. That if a deer doesn't learn to doesn't learn to run fast enough, hmm, then the deer will be devoured by a tiger. So a mother deer cannot protect the baby deer when a tiger is attacking. The only way a mother deer can protect a baby deer is by pushing the deer to run as fast as possible. So similarly, there is that he's saying that you cannot protect Dhritarashtra for long. He says, therefore, turn towards the Lord. Here it is said that look on the Lord. Don't look at everyone else. That means that don't think that you are the sole protector of Dhritarashtra. Ultimately, the Lord is the protector. In the Bhagavad Gita, in 529, the verse that Prabhupada called the peace formula. He said the last part is, Surudam Sarva Bhutanam Gyatvamam Shanti Mrichati. So, Shila Prabhupada applied it even to outer peace, that if you actually understand how Krishna is the proprietor, enjoyer, well-wisher, then we will have peace in the outer world also. In the context of the Gita, Krishna is referring to inner peace. Arjuna is agitated. How can I fight against my relatives? Now, how can I possibly kill Bhishma and Drona? He says, Katham Bhishma Maham Sankhe Dronam Jamadu Sudhana Ishu Bhi Pratyotsyami Puja Ravari Sudhana I meant to worship them. So Krishna's implication, the Acharya has explained, is that Arjuna, don't think you are the greatest well-wisher of the Kauravas. I am their greatest well-wisher. 
and you are thinking that shooting arrows at them is going to cause them pain and you want to save them from that pain but he says i know what is causing them greater pain G far greater pain is caused to them because they are obliged to fight on the side of a person who has no morals who is so vicious so my plan of Ar Krish arjuna krishna is implying my plan is to free them from this circumstance and the terrible obligation that it brings and they are good souls they have done good karma so once they are freed from the situation they will be elevated to a higher situation they will be liberated so my plan for them is better than even your best plan so therefore be an instrument for my plan and that will do it is not just for you to win a kingdom my plan will do the best for everyone once we understand that krishna is the well wisher krishna is the benefactor of everyone then what happens is shanti mrichati we become peaceful so so just the lesson that arjuna was given over there that we can't do everything for even one person what to speak for everyone we do our part in krishna's plan for the good of others we all have some part to play so the implication is narad muni saying is you have done your part now you have done your part and the trashtra is an onward journey and then later verses towards the end of his monologue narad muni will tell what has happened to the trashtra and how he will move forward and he will become enlightened so the idea is that here narad muni's implication is the trashtra don't infantilize sorry yudhishthir don't infantilize the trashtra at you know he has lived in a way that is regrettable if not reprehensible but at least now he has done something right don't stop him don't think that if he has done something right that means you have done something wrong it is not that you failed in his your duty it is that at last he recognized what his duty is so sometimes people who are very conscientious now there are people who are we could say under responsible and there are people who are over responsible people who are under responsible they are always conscious whether others are doing their duty to them or not but they are not conscious whether they are doing their duty or not you know you didn't do this for me you didn't do this for me you didn't do this for me well you didn't do this you didn't do this what's that got to do you should be doing this still no relationships are reciprocal so under responsible people they over expect from others without doing anything in return but sometimes people can be some many people especially those who are virtuous they can go to the other extreme they can be over responsible over responsible means we don't just see what the other person is doing we keep doing for the other person if we keep doing for the other person without a reciprocation then eventually they start taking us for granted and then our time our energy is not utilized properly we feel disappointed so shri prabhupad was going i was doing all that he could to try to share krishna bhakti in india when he saw that people were not responding he did oh maybe i am not presenting krishna bhakti properly no he said if they are not responding let me go somewhere where they will respond that brings us to the last part so evaluation evaluation is that whether this per whether this person that i need to protect this person right now or i need to give the let the consequences come or myself deliver the consequences of the action and the last is renunciation renunciation means sometimes if a person is getting the consequences of their actions we just need to move out of the way we just need to move we cannot guard them from the consequences of their actions we need to let the consequences hit them i i was just a few months ago in america so i was at one place and i was giving a class and there was about a little elderly about 60 65 year old man and he was with a 5 year old daughter, girl so i thought he was his daughter she was his daughter then i asked him he said she is my granddaughter and he says my daughter is a drug addict and she no she she doesn't even know who the father of this girl is and she she says she should get into trouble and i used to bail her out and and then she had this daughter so i felt at least i should take care of to take care of the daughter i should take care of her mother and then he said that eventually 
so uh, when she 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 just neglected her house and what happened was she kept some gas or something to on her house got burned so then i asked her to come into my house and while she was in my house she stole my life savings and went away and only she went away when she went away she left her daughter in the home alone and he had gone out station so he says my daughter was starving for almost 24 hours so he said at that time i decided enough is enough so i informed the authorities and then i started formal pro procedure for adopting my granddaughter and then so she, i told her you have to go into a rehabilitation center so this daughter in a rehabilitation center she met some hari krishna devotees and that helped her to get her act together she's still in the rehabilitation center but he says when i saw how much my daughter had changed she says what are these hari krishnas so i have come to explore that was the second or third time i had come to the temple for the program so he said that actually it was when i stopped protecting my daughter that actually she started improving so renunciation doesn't mean we don't care for the people whom we love it means that we understand that caring can take different forms sometimes caring means letting the person get the consequences of their action and that may seem that we are being hard hearted but it is not we who are being hard hearted we are simply preparing them for the hard reality of the world so uh, so in this way now yudhishthir is being told that you know you may not be there to protect the trashtra but you are not an independent person you were an instrument of krishna you did your duty now it is the supreme lord who will take care of the person so in this way when we are whether we are parents whether we are guides whether we are teachers whether we are mentors counselors and there are, when we express our love there are different ways in which love can be expressed at different times and understanding that how do we know how we can express the love first is by understanding that we are not the sources of love we are channels of love we are actually offering love on behalf of the lord we are instrument to be his instruments and then if we have a prayerful inner connection with the lord that if we maintain our inner connection with the lord strongly then tadami buddhi yogam tam yena mama payantite we will get the wisdom from within we will get the inner illumination how best to express that love in whichever particular relationship we are uh, we are encountering at present so that is how bhakti is not just about you know, oh, just chanting hari krishna and loving krishna bhakti is about a different way of living in the world a different way of approaching all our relationships in the world where we take up greater responsibility by recognizing the limitedness of our responsibility we are limited beings and to the extent we recognize that then we can take greater responsibility by sometimes protecting by sometimes evalu educating sometimes evaluating sometimes renouncing so i'll summarize i discussed today the topic of does love mean saving our loved ones from the consequences of their actions so here yudhishthir was trying to do that dhritarashtra never acknowledged leave alone apologized for all that he had done and dhritarashtra enabled duryodhana although yudhishthir certainly didn't enable dhritarashtra but in he didn't he felt that i just need to do my duty and take care of him but that didn't that, that didn't lead to any growth for dhritarashtra and when vidura strong words brought some renunciation within him dhritra duryodhana felt so yudhishthir felt that i have done something wrong so yudhishthir through philosophy is being guided by narad muni that that you are not at fault here you always you did the right thing but now the right thing is to let go to let the trashtra go in that connection i discussed mr janakya's words love can be expressed in different ways the peer acronym what is p protect as a small baby has to be protected by the parents whatever the action the child is doing so love does means protecting it, protecting our loved ones from the consequence of their actions but that is not the only way to love e is education Now, actions do have consequences the world is a harsh place and we are not going to be always there to protect so we need to educate that this action will lead to this consequence and sometimes if somebody has a buffer of good karma the consequences may not come immediately but that does not mean the consequences not going to come as i say higher you go the harder you fall the consequences will come eventually and then third he was 
valuation. So if somebody's got into a mess, then we have to evaluate. Do I, how do I help at this point? Do I help by protecting them from the consequences? Do I help by, by help helping them to deal with the consequences? What do I do at this time? Did they, was it because of their own mistakes or because of their, because they just fell way over the head? It was beyond their, they faced something beyond their capacity. So evaluation is required. And then, <clears throat> so an R was renunciation. But sometimes we just need to step aside. And that is what is being told over here to Yudhishthir, that the Trashtra has at last taken responsibility now, no, just step aside. So when we understand that Krishna is the supreme well-wisher, then even when something bad seems to be happening to someone around us, at that time we understand that Krishna's plan is operational. And that doesn't mean we become hard-hearted, but we see what I can do to help this person to grow up, to move onward in their spiritual journey. So when we connect ourselves with Krishna internally, then we will be guided from within how best to express love in which situation, in which relationship. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu, for this uh, wonderful class. Uh, you, you made one point, you raised the question, the dharma is uh, conditional or a dharma is independent? So I didn't get what's the answer for that. Is dharma conditional or non-conditional? Well, definitely it is contextual. That is, means it's conditional. Desha kala, desha kala vibhagavita, as you say. Dharma, that's described in the Bhagavatam also. The idea is that, yes, one should, for example, speak the truth. But, is speaking the truth the sole thing to consider all the time? No, if speaking the truth is going to have terrible consequences, it's going to harm someone, then maybe at that time speaking the truth is not the best thing to do. So, rather than thinking of dharma as being... Uh, so rather than thinking of dharma as, okay, like we have one dharma, okay, I have to obey my elders, or I have to protect my family, or I have to do this. Dharma is subtle. And that means we have to weigh various factors. The content of our action, the intent of our action, the consequence of our action. And based on that, we need to evaluate what is the right thing to do. That's why, that's a dharma se tattvam nitam guhayam. At one level, dharmam tu sakshad bhagavat pranitam. The dharma is what is given by the Lord. At the same time, in a particular situation that we are facing, what is the dharma? And that is something which has to be carefully thought and decided. That's why, what is it said about Yudhishthira Maharaj that Vipra dharma achyuta ashrayaha. So he took guidance from outside from the Brahmanas. He connected with the Lord internally, achyuta, but he himself contemplated what is dharma. So, there is the social aspect, the intellectual aspect, the philosophical aspect, and the devotional aspect. So all three are required for one to determine what is the right thing to do. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes, please. How to practice the hour of renunciation? It depends on exploring or investigating, introspecting, what is it that is stopping us from doing that? Hmm? So generally, when we have to let go in a particular relationship, it may be multiple factors. It may be the concern for the other person. You know, how will that person be able to function without me? Or it may be concern for ourselves. You know, I won't be able to function without other person. Because every relationship, it takes a toll from us, but it also gives something to us. You know, there are some people who have a very high need to be needed. We all have that. We all have a need to be needed. But some people have a very high need to be needed. Then what happens is that if this person is no longer there in my life, then that person won't need me anymore if I, if I let go of that relationship. So, or I may feel that you know, this person is there, that they're, they're taking care of me, whatever it is. So we have to explore and find out what is it that is causing me hesitation in letting go? And then once we find that, then we address it specifically. 
okay, if I'm thinking that this person will not, so without me, how will this person take care of themselves? Well, yeah, but is it really true if I'm not there, if I go out, so go out station somewhere, isn't there someone else to take care of them? Well, can't they take care of themselves? Ultimately, philosophically, understand we are all temporary. Eventually, uh, at least our, our physical existence is temporary. So, we are all going to die. You know, aren't they going to take care of themselves afterwards? So, this doesn't mean we just cut off our responsibilities. It just means that we have to deliberate. And similarly, if, if I feel that I need this person, and I can't be without this person, then is that something which is healthy for me or not so healthy for me? Is it that I am, big, I am creating an unhealthy dependence on that person? See, we, in one sense, cannot be at all independent. We can't be independent of the Lord. And even in this world, we are, we are interdependent. We live in an interdependent world. But sometimes, some forms of dependencies can be toxic. So, is this, when I feel that I can't be without this person, what is it that is causing that? Is that healthy? Is that unhealthy? And based on that, when we do an introspection like that, then, okay, then if this person is serving a particular need for me, then mm, is there some other way that need can be served? Or is it that that need itself is something which is, uh, which is something which I need to decrease that? And I need to be able to learn to live without that. So we'll have to explore that. Generally, we'll find that once we start investigating, exploring specifics, we'll find that letting go is not as difficult as it seems. It's, a, it's just like in sensual pleasure, the anticipation of the pleasure is always greater than the pleasure. And, oh, I'll eat this, I'll watch this, I'll listen. like a, some new movie is going to come. The premiere, there's so much hype about it. But actually, when people go and watch the movie, hey, okay, it's over now. So, just like with respect to material pleasure, the anticipation is far greater than the actual pleasure. Similarly, with respect to material fears, the fear of letting go specifically, actually, the apprehension, the, the fear is, the fear of the event is actually, the fear of how troublesome the event is, is actually far greater than how troublesome or how distressing the event actually, the act actually is. So if we try doing that, it will find that it's not that difficult. Okay. So thank you very much. Granthraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gaur Bhakta Vrindaki. Chitai Gaur Primanandi.